Hi, thank you for watching Dig Into China. I'm Dong Xiong. If you have not done so already, please subscribe to my channel. Thank you very much. Today, I'd like to discuss a clever strategy employed by China's state-owned banks, specifically the remarkable move of Liaoning Province State-Owned Assets Operation Corp, acquiring Shengjing Bank. This topic is brought to the forefront due to its direct connection with the Evergrande debt crisis. Shengjing Bank became widely known mainly due to its past association with Evergrande, which leveraging its majority ownership significantly drained the bank's capital. However, when Evergrande faced its financial collapse, Shengjing Bank accumulated substantial bad debts, pushing it to almost to the brink of failure. Subsequently, Liaoning Province state-owned assets operation intervened by injecting capital and increasing its stake in Shengjing Bank, effectively severing the bank's ownership ties with Evergrande. Nonetheless, while Liaoning state-owned assets successfully severed the ties between Shengjing Bank and Evergrande, they had to confront the substantial problem of a considerable volume of bad debts held by Shengjing Bank. As a result, Shengjing Bank embarked on a process to transfer non-performing assets to the Liaoning Province State-Owned Assets Operation Corp. Many of you might find the intricacies of this transaction perplexing. In, re in reality, if one is familiar with how the four major state-owned banks disposed of non-performing assets to the four major asset management companies in the past, it becomes evident that the Liaoning's actions are simply a form of imitation, albeit a simplified one. How does Shengjing Bank handle the disposal of non-performing assets? What's the underlying principle behind it? And how did the four major state-owned banks manage the removal of non-performing assets in the past? Today, I will provide an overview of these topics. Let's start by understanding the situation at Shengjing Bank. On September 27th, Shengjing Bank made an announcement. They disclosed their plans to sell assets totaling 154.4 billion yuan, which when combined with accrued interest income of 29.3 billion yuan, amounts to a total of 183.7 billion yuan. All of these assets are to be sold to Liaoning Province State-Owned Asset Corp Operation Corp for a price of 176 billion yuan. This seemingly straightforward announcement actually conveys a multitude of insights. To begin with, Shengjing Bank's plan to sell 154.4 billion worth of assets accompanied by 29.3 billion in interest income raises the questions about implied loan interest rate, which appears to be almost 19%. Given our knowledge of how banks typically structure their long terms, it's evident that this isn't a year's worth of interest. Instead, it likely encompasses a minimum of four years' worth. This implies that Shengjing Bank hasn't received interest payments on these 154.4 billion yuan loans for a considerable four-year period, suggesting that they are essentially non-performing loans, which is why divestment is on the horizon. Let's now delve into Shengjing Bank's financial reports to uncover the extent of their officially disclosed non-performing loans. In the first half of 2023, Shengjing Bank reported total assets of 1 trillion and 95.1 billion yuan, with total liabilities reaching 1 trillion and 12.8 billion yuan. Their shareholders' equity was a modest 82.3 billion. Surprisingly, the bank's reported balance of non-performing loans stood at a mere 19.65 billion yuan. As previously discussed, Shengjing Bank is looking to divest non-performing loans totaling 183.7 billion, which have remained unpaid for four years. In compassing both the principal and accrued interest, there is a glaring contrast between the officially reported 19.65 billion yuan in non-performing loans and the substantial 183.7 billion yuan that Shengning Bank aims to divest. This stock difference underscores the impressive artistry of Chinese state-owned banks in concealing non-performing loans. 
The actual situation is that Shenzhen Bank possesses over 180 billion in bad debt, and their net assets have been in negative territory for some time. Out of this substantial sum of over 180 billion in non-performing loans, how much can be attributed to Evergrande? In reality, it's merely 32.6 billion, a figure readily verifiable within Evergrande's debt decomposition. Therefore, while Evergrande bears a significant share of the responsibility amounting to only one-fifth of the total, Shenzhen Bank's mismanagement of their business cannot be solely attributed to Evergrande, as they have been involved in their fair share of questionable activities. Now, let's delve into how Liaoning Province State-Owned Assets Operation Corporation went about separating Shenzhen Bank's non-performing assets. According to the announcement, Shenzhen Bank sold assets totaling 183.7 billion yuan to Liaoning Province State-Owned Asset Operation at a price of 176 billion yuan. But where did Liaoning Province State-Owned Assets Operation procure this 176 billion yuan? They issued 15-year special bonds totaling 176 billion to raise the necessary capital from Shenzhen Bank, offering an annual interest rate of 2.25%. In simpler terms, Liaoning Province State-Owned Asset Operation borrowed a sum of money from Shenzhen Bank to acquire Shenzhen Bank's troubled assets. This arrangement has proven to be advantageous for Shenzhen Bank, although their financial records may display a 7.7 .7 billion yuan loss. This is offset by the fact that they sold 176 billion worth of assets from a total of 183.7 billion. Consequently, the overall quality of their assets has been a substantial improvement. Shenzhen Bank, which once carried a burden of 183.7 billion in non-performing assets now holds a 176 billion in high quality assets secure in the knowledge that Liaoning Province State-Owned Assets Operation Corp is a reliable entity that will meet its financial commitments now, a new question arises. Liaoning Province State-Owned Assets Operation has taken on Shenzhen Bank's 183.7 billion yuan in troubled assets, and they need a strategy to recover them. While Shenzhen Bank has lightened its load, Liaoning Province State-Owned Asset Operation has acquired a debt. Behind the Liaoning Assets Operation is Liaoning Province's financial sector. And if this sector has additional expenses, it implies that the resources are being diverted diverted from other areas, which may not be favorable for overall economic development. This leads us to the approach used by the four major state-owned banks in the past to offload their non-performing assets to the four major asset management companies. What was the process for the four major state-owned banks to deal with their bad loans, and how did the four major asset management companies handle them at that time? Let's travel back in time to the year 1999, a period when China's four major state-owned banks were preparing for their initial public offerings. To facilitate these IPOs, it was essential to offload a substantial load of non-performing assets that were weighing down their balance sheets. In reality, during that era, the scale of non-performing loans within state-owned banks had surpassed a staggering 3 trillion yuan, with a non-performing loan ratio reaching 45%. To put this into perspective, these banks collectively held assets of approximately 7 trillion yuan, and a staggering 3 trillion yuan was classified as a bad debt. This figure, by today's standard, would undoubtedly be astonishing. However, during that time, this was the reality. Consequently, addressing the bad loan predicament was an imperative prerequisite for the state-owned banks to proceed with their IPOs. To resolve this challenge, the People's Bank of China, aka China's central bank, ultimately decided to divest the banks of 1.4 trillion yuan in bad loan. Why did they not offload the full 3 trillion yuan of bad loans? The primary constraint was the lack of capacity. The central bank had already exerted every available resource to remove that 1.4 trillion yuan in non-performing assets. 
Let's delve into how this situation was managed at that time. The approach taken was to establish four major asset management companies and then transfer the 1.4 trillion yuan in bad debt from the four state-owned banks to these asset management firms at a one-on-one -on -one price ratio. At that time, these asset management companies were granted a 10-year term, which would end with their liquidation upon the completion of their tasks. So, in order to facilitate this one-on-one -on -one transfer of 1.4 trillion yuan in bad loans from the state-owned banks, how did the People's Bank of China secure this 1.4 trillion yuan? To handle the situation, the Ministry of Finance initially injected 40 billion yuan in capital to establish the four major asset management companies, each aligned with a specific state-owned bank. Subsequently, with the backing of the Ministry of Finance, these asset management companies secured a 570 billion yuan in rediscount loans from the People's Bank of China. In addition, they issued 820 billion yuan in financial bonds with a fixed annual interest rate of 2.25% to the four major state-owned banks and the China Development Bank. Interestingly, the recent operations in Liaoning appear to have closely followed this established model down to the identical interest rate. This approach ensured that the four major asset management companies had the required funds. It began with the Ministry of Finance allocating an initial 40 billion yuan as capital for the four asset management companies, with each corresponding to one of the state-owned banks. Then, with the backing of the Ministry of Finance, these asset management companies secured 570 billion yuan in refinancing from the People's Bank of China. Additionally, they issued 820 billion yuan in financial bonds with an annual interest rate of 2.25%, subscribed by the four major state-owned banks and the China Development Bank. The total sum of 1.43 trillion yuan proved to be adequate for the one-on-one -on -one transfer of the non-performing assets from the state-owned banks. This, it's worth noting that at that time, the state-owned banks faced high non-performing loan ratios, which meant their capital adequacy was low, and they lacked the capacity to extend the entire 820 billion yuan to the asset management companies. In response, the People's Bank of China implemented, implemented the reserve requirement reductions, and the Ministry of Finance injected capital into the state-owned banks. It was a Herculean effort to handle the 1.4 trillion yuan of non-performing assets, which explains why not all of the state-owned banks' bad debt could be removed at that time. Fast forward to 2006, seven years later, the four major asset management companies delivered what seemed like good news. They had successfully disposed of 1.1 trillion yuan out of the 1.4 trillion yuan in non-performing assets they had taken on. However, during the audit, it was discovered that the cash generated from asset sales was insufficient to cover the outstanding loans and the interest on the financial bonds owed to the People's Bank of China. If we calculate an interest rate of 2.25% over 7 years, they would need to pay around 30 billion yuan in interest annually, accumulating to over 200 billion yuan. In essence, even after seven years of managing the 1.4 trillion yuan in bad debt inherited from the state-owned banks, they hadn't made enough to cover the 200 billion yuan in interest payments. So, what was the solution? With the 10-year deadline looming, they had no option but to request an extension, allowing the four major asset management companies to continue operation while deferring the debt. How did they manage this extension? To ad address this, they employed several strategies. One, the 570 billion yuan loan owed to the People's Bank was essentially put on hold with no further interest payments required. Two, the 820 billion yuan in financial bonds owed to the banks were extended for another 10 years. 3. The Ministry of Finance established a joint managed fund to utilize its resources for repaying the principal amount. This fund was funded by income tax payments from state-owned banks and asset management companies, along with allocations from the Ministry of Finance. 
As you can observe, if this trajectory continued, it would essentially be the Ministry of Finance that would have to bear the cost of these bad assets. However, luck took a sudden turn for the better. After 2008, China's real estate sector began to thrive, leading to a significant surge in profits for state-owned banks. Consequently, their annual income tax payments also saw substantial growth. Let's use China Construction Bank as an example. CCB's corresponding asset management company is Sinda. In 2010, Sinda still had 200 billion yuan in unpaid debt, but by 2012, the debt had shrunk to 57.6 billion yuan, with 148.6 billion yuan paid off over those three years. During this period, the CCB paid a total 147.6 billion yuan in taxes. In essence, CCB used its own profit to settle Sinda's debt. This implies that the CCB ultimately absorbed its own historical bad debt. However, it's crucial to recognize that this was contingent on a prerequisite, China's robust economic growth resulting in expanding bank size and growing profits. All right, let's revisit the matter concerning Shengjin Bank. Currently, Shengjin Bank's non-performing assets have been transferred to an asset management company, with the Liaoning Provincial Finance Department providing a safety net, much like what the Ministry of Finance did for state-owned banks in the past. But is there a possibility for Shengjin Bank to follow the path of those state-owned banks and eventually eliminate those bad debts using its own profits? At the present, this seems highly improbable, as China's economy is currently in a state of decline, quite different from the robust growth of earlier times. Without economic expansion, how can we expect debts to be eradicated? Therefore, Shengjin Bank and the Liaoning Provincial Finance Department are faced with only two viable paths. One option is for Shengjin Bank to outperform its competitors and expand during a period of stagnant assets by acquiring high-quality assets from other banks. If this proves unattainable, the second option is for Liaoning Provincial Finance Department to generate revenue through various means such as imposing increased fines or selling additional assets. I speculate that the Liaoning state-owned assets might have this in mind. If they don't separate those bad debt from Shengjin Bank, the bank won't even have a chance to compete in the market with its existing assets. So Shengjin Bank can't afford to give up. These bad debts must be divested. Whether Shengjin Bank can turn things around is uncertain, and they'll have to do their best and hope for the best. As for the debt that the Liaoning state-owned asset has taken on, if their financial situation ever becomes too burdensome, then they can turn to Beijing for help. It's worth noting that this approach isn't unique to Liaoning. Other provinces are following similar paths. If everyone collectively faces financial challenges, the central government can't simply stand by. If local areas are in distress, so is the central government. It can be said that Liaoning's perspective echoes the genuine sentiments of many other provinces. Currently, the approach appears to be a collective descent into economic woes. The rationale behind this strategy is that if all regions deteriorate simultaneously, there is a reduced risk of the central government not intervening. In practice, Beijing has indeed adopted a more lenient stance, as evidenced by its allocation of 1.5 trillion yuan this year to facilitate the refinancing of hidden debts by various provinces. However, the fiscal burden carried by local government is extremely high. Even if they transition from high-interest local investment bonds to low-interest government bonds, it essentially amounts to leveraging the financial system to support local debt. This possesses a precarious situation as it involves trading time for respite. Contingent on the anticipation of another phase of rapid economic growth, failure to realize this growth could ultimately strain the financial system to the point of collapse. Thank you for watching. Please leave a comment and subscribe to my channel. Just click the subscribe button right here. I'll see you again shortly. Until then, be well.